This webisode of Waterways is brought to you by Yamaha. Yamaha revs your heart. Boat Blurb, inspired boating content. Become a subscriber today. And St. Clair Boat Sales, turning boaters' dreams into reality. The temperature's rising and you're feeling the heat. Oh, you will want it to be. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode one of Waterways. I am your host, Stephen Bull. This is an all new recreational boating lifestyle show. If you're floating your boat, and I always say, so we're going to be telling stories about kayaks, sailboats, power boats, little cruisers, high speed offshore poker run go fast boats, absolutely anything affiliated with the water I am interested in and I want to hear the stories of the people, the places, the history, and we're going to start right here. Over my shoulder, I hope you can see the skyline of Toronto, Ontario, Canada's largest city, the fourth largest in North America. And this is my hometown. I grew up in the East End, not far from the lake. So I always knew the water was there. Uh, it just never felt like a waterfront city. And it certainly didn't feel like a vibrant boating community. At least that's what I thought before I bought this. This is the boat that my wife and I have bought nine seasons ago, and we keep it right downtown in the Inner Harbor along with about a thousand other seasonal boaters and a million or so tourists that come and check out the harbor every year. When you look outside the harbor, there's thousands of more not far from where we're floating and rocking in Lake Ontario at the moment. And so I started thinking, if I could be this wrong about my hometown in terms of boating stories, what do I really know about anywhere else? So that's what Waterways is all about. We're gonna go out everywhere, find the stories in, on, and around the water. And we're gonna start right here in Toronto. But first, to give you a sense of what we're gonna be showing you, here's a little clip show to kick off this series. And this year for the ship's 101st birthday, it's spectacular to see the snowbirds at an air show. It's amazing to stand on the decks of a 101 year old ship and talk to actual sailors who are living and breathing the Navy today. Because of those, you know, those character defining elements, it was in 1978 deemed its National Historic Site of Canada, which makes the Peterborough Lift Lock within the Trent Severn Waterway its own historic site. Oh, really? Whoa. And here we are, buddy, with over 1,030,000 litres of water suspended 65 feet above our heads. Is it okay to admit I'm just like a tiny bit nervous? I mean, it's 118 years, it's been fine. We're, we're running, I believe, I think they calculated around 3,000 square feet, not counting the engine room. That's exactly yeah. double my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's quite the boat. Yeah. We're still filming, so there's more that's not even in that little clip montage coming your way, but right now, Let's dive deep into the stories here in Toronto. Starting with the fact that this is still a working port. So York was founded here because of the protected harbor. Now it's the islands, it used to be a peninsula. In 1858, the Eastern Gap got blown open in the storm and they ended up keeping it, dredging it wider for shipping. So now it's the Toronto Islands. But that harbor town of York and Fort York and its historic strategic place is still relevant. It's still used as a working port. And as a proof point, there is a tradition that has been going on for longer than Canada has been a country right here in the harbor of Toronto. And it is called the Beaver Hat Ceremony. If you've ever driven down Queen's Quay, perhaps en route to film a TV episode, hypothetically speaking, of course, you might have noticed something slipped in amongst the condos on the waterfront. And though it might just be another freighter to you, the arrival of the first one of the season kicks off a tradition that dates back to 1861. 
You see, it's not every ship that Harbor Master Emeritus Angus Armstrong boards to greet. I mean, I don't really know how many he does, to be honest, but what I do know is that only once per year does he carry this box with him. And it's the kind of cargo that warrants a space on the captain's seat and to be handled with white gloves. A top hat made of beaver pelt, which was all the rage in the mid 1800s. We're very careful with it because it is an original beaver hat uh, and uh, we only take it out the once a year. And the reward for the captain of the ship that got the season going was presented with the same thing this captain is getting. The presentation of the hat, a briefcase, and a whopping $100. It was a practical idea. You gotta remember that Toronto in the wintertime was inaccessible. The railways hadn't come through yet. So it was important to try to get, to really promote the first goods coming into Toronto. So these captains would race and sail ships down the lake to be the first ship in, and that would get the shipping season going. The modern iteration is a small media event, but back in the day, this was a huge deal. Well, they almost got the keys to the city for the day. It was built around this port. Uh, and uh, you came in, you were considered to be a VIP for the entire time you were here. Okay, full disclosure, this particular ceremony was from 2019. But what do you want from me? I can only do so much. I mean, look at me. They couldn't even find a construction helmet to fit my head. Still, that helmet fared better than some of the hats. Well, they used to be able to get to keep it for the day and walk up and down the streets of Toronto, but then a few times in bar fights and getting filled with beer and kicked down the street, it was decided that uh, it was too tough on the hat. Oh, we gotta wait a second. We're directly under the flight path. That's the other thing. There is one of the country's busiest airports right here in the harbor, Billy Bishop Island Airport. So you also have planes flying around. But this is a boat show. We're not gonna talk about the planes. And if you want to find out what's going on in the industry, going to a boat show, one of the international boat shows is a great idea. Now the Toronto International Boat Show was virtual the last couple years, but for the first time in two years, the Miami International Boat Show, which in the eyes of many people, is kind of like the Detroit Auto Show equivalent. It's where a lot of the huge launches happen. That was back in person in South Beach, and I went to check it out. The Miami Boat Show goes down in February, but in South Florida, it's always boating season. It's a massive, multi-location show with outdoor and indoor elements. Boaters have been coming here every year since 1969. Well, until COVID happened. So we're talking about two years of pent-up boating demand and excitement. Everyone and everything is excited. I mean, this puppy's wagging its tail. One of the cool things about the Miami show is you can run into neighbors from Canada. Peter Robert, double our performance. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? Good. So here in the Nortec booth, you guys always have cool stuff. Uh, what's this one? So that's as cool as we've had. This is the new 400 Sport, all new. This is hull number one. No one's ever seen it before the show. Incredible new boat. Well, oh. these center consoles are really taking off. It's not just the Roadsters anymore, right? No, I mean, the center console is the game. That's the new offshore boat. The the old stern drive performance boats, they don't really get built anymore new in any any large volumes anyhow. Um, these do everything those boats did, but they do it better. And uh, they do it reliably and they have great resale value. And they turn those boats into blockbuster video. And this is Netflix. I like it. And you can't say this doesn't have the cool factor though, right? That's awesome. That's you awesome. can't look at that and think it's not cool. Yeah. Awesome. I can't. Well, I gotta. I might just hang out by it. It'll kind of up my cool factor by. <laughs> That'll be tough. That'll be tough to do. <laughs> All right, I'm ending this interview now. Okay, we're at the Sea Dew booth now with my friend Tim McKercher. How are you, buddy? Man, good to see you again. We're pretty excited to be here. I mean, it's been a pretty crazy two years. It's been uh, phenomenal to be in the boating industry these past two years. And we came out with some new product this year. 
We're, we're expanding our fishing line on our personal watercraft, and now we've cool. launched our new Fish Pro Trophy that almost has tournament caliber, caliber uh, features on it. And a brand new sea Switch, an entirely new segment for sea -Doo. We're getting into the pontoon boat business now. Wow, is that it? <laughs> no, yeah, it's time to leave the air conditioned convention center and head outside. But it's Miami, it's hot, so we gotta stay hydrated. Thanks, boss. And I gotta worry about the sun too, so I'm gonna need a hat. Well, th those are for sale. It's okay, ma'am. I'm a television host. Boat shows happen in cities all across America, but the Miami one is different. It's got the best of everything from kayaks to, well, not kayaks. And maybe if this is in your budget, your biggest problem is do I get the gray one or do I get the white one? A lot of boats you'll see have really traditional timeless lines. And then you also get ones like this. Makes me wonder where they put the flux capacitor. It's kind of funky. Walking around the docks and looking at all these beauties is a good time, but you can actually get out on the water. Well over 100 boats here are available for test drives, so you can get out on the water in Miami as well. This show is so big, I'm told the economic impact is over $1 billion. But that's enough Miami. Time to get back home. Checked out that Pershing. The color though is not exactly what I want, so I passed this time. Next time. So we talk about safety, we talk about training. It's not just for the new boaters. Listen to my buddy, tell him who you are. Rick Lazell, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Boating Ontario Association. I have worked in the boat business longer than some of you that are listening. I've been in this industry for over 33 years. I've driven small boats, big boats, pontoon boats, personal watercraft, ski boats, tow boats, you name it. Three years ago in 2020, I bought my first cruiser. I bought an 11,000 pound twin engine, 32 foot cruiser, and I was nervous. And I'm still a little bit nervous, but the best investment that I made when we took delivery of our new boat, I hired a trainer to come up and teach my wife and I what our mutual roles and responsibilities are on the boat. It has made us better boaters. It has made us better, more confident boaters. I feel better at the helm. She feel, feels better knowing what her roles are. It has made the entire boating experience better, and it's the cheapest investment we made in our sport. Do it. Nine years ago, we told our friends that we would be keeping our newly purchased used boat in Toronto. You'll get bored of it. There's nothing to do there. It's too busy. It's too noisy. You name it, I heard it. But here we are, closing it on a decade, and I still smile when I get the boat up on plane. I have about 73,000 photos of the skyline, day and night. It never gets old. And we love this as our boating base. Again, total mea culpa here. I was way wrong when it came to this not being a boating community. Sometimes we head into the wide open Lake Ontario, across the lake to explore New York State or the North Shore of the Niagara region. But a lot of the time, we just circle the islands and anchor off one of the beaches on the lake side of the islands, which are blue flag certified, by the way, meaning the water meets cleanliness standards. But just as often as any of that, we use our rib. And when you get in amongst the lagoons that weave between the islands, it really does feel like you're a million miles away. Years ago, this was a different scene. The islands were a bustling community, not a massive park. Where the island airport is, was a massive amusement park that for some reason chucked horses into the water. There was a baseball stadium here where Babe Ruth apparently hit his first professional home run while playing for the Providence Grays. And there was a lighthouse standing guard along the skyline more than 150 years before the CN Tower. In fact, it's still here. This is the Gibraltar Point Lighthouse and it dates back to 1808. It's the oldest remaining lighthouse anywhere on the Great Lakes and one of the oldest buildings in Toronto. Legend has it, it's haunted by its first keeper who was apparently murdered in 1815. But if you ask me, I'm more worried about the cormorants who have suddenly taken over the islands. They flock en masse and their droppings kill the trees and it stinks like crazy. 
Today, the bulk of the islands are either left to nature or are public parks enjoyed by more than a million people each year. The shoreline has changed as much as the skyline and nowhere is it more drastically evident than the Toronto Harbour Commission's building, which was once along the water, but is now landlocked and 250 meters from the water. It's unique and big and historic, but it's also very busy. So right there, you can see docking now is one of the City of Toronto ferries. That ride is 90 seconds long, 121 meters. It's one of, if not the shortest active ferry in the world. If you're boating through here, which is the Western Gap, the airport off to my starboard and the city off to port, you gotta pay attention to that. It blows its horn and it goes. It has the priority. Same with the Hanlon's Ferry, Center Island Ferry and Wards Island Ferries, the bigger ones that you see out in the Inner Harbor. The dotted line on the chart means that is part of the standard waterway. They don't move, they don't go around you and they'll probably be docked and the captain's at home before they realize there's a scuff of paint on the side of their giant boat from yours. So they get the right away and they deserve the right away. And all of these rules and things and how busy it is with the tour boats and water taxis and you know people filming TV shows for goodness sake, there's a lot to think about and a lot to know, which is why the powered vessel operator's permit is something that Ports Toronto issues and you need if you're gonna be boating in Toronto Harbor. It actually extends outside of the islands as well. You're gonna to wanna to check on the maps to make sure, because that is something that the Toronto Police Marine Unit look for. And basically, they just want you to know all the rules of the road because, you know, there's a lot that's the same about boating here and any, as anywhere else, but there are quite a few different things. It's like driving in rush hour traffic in downtown Toronto without any driver training or experience. It would be overwhelming, but it's also really awesome. Well, there goes a big tour boat right now. So we're a couple nautical miles off of Toronto out in Lake Ontario in about 200 feet of water. We're in a 38 foot power boat. And if you're watching this at home and saying, that's all well and great for you, Steve, but I've got a smaller trailerable boat. Are you gonna have content for me? Yes. And this is my trailer. I only actually use it twice a year to put our rib in and take it out. And if you're like that, then you're gonna really wanna do an inspection each time you use it, make sure it's road worthy and road safe. If you use it all the time, you're gonna be doing these little checks more often. And the three things you wanna check out every time, you just do a quick inspection, doesn't take long, but you wanna look at the wheels, the wires, and the where the boat goes part. Also known as the bunks. Don't email me and say that that's not the proper term. Even though it is, because I said it on TV, which means it's legit. All right, starting with the wheels, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they're inflated to the right pressure, that the tread and the bearings and everything looks like they're in good shape. Uh, for the wires, you're gonna to wanna to do a visual inspection, make sure there's no fraying. And when you connect them, always, always, always check the lights, check your brake lights, and that your turn signals are working properly. And the where the boat goes part, these bunks. Most of the time, uh, if you get a, let's call it more affordable trailer, uh, you're not gonna have those fancy plastic rollers. They're gonna be wood wrapped in some sort of kind of carpeting thing. You wanna make sure they're not rotten. So give it a good pull. Don't, don't be gentle with it and just kind of touch. You're putting a heavy boat on here. You wanna know that it'll hold it uh, before you get on the highway. And the last step before you actually launch or haul out is you wanna do a visual inspection of the ramp itself. And I'm not worried about the optics and what's offshore. This isn't particularly pretty backdrop, but the ramp itself is in great shape. It's double wide. It looks like it's got a nice, long, gentle slope. Uh, often you'll find a ramp will tell you where the concrete slab ends. If it doesn't, just be extra cautious going in because it doesn't go on forever. Eventually it'll drop. And with hundreds of boats every summer, revving their engine to get up on the trailer, it can dig out sometimes a couple feet deep down there. And if your wheels go off the end, it can be hard to get out, which is why a nice other touch I noticed at the top of this ramp is they have anchors put in that you could attach a winch to to get the trailer out or something like that if you need to. But we're not gonna worry about that because we have a small boat and we're gonna be smart about it. So, trailer's in good shape, ramp's in good shape. Now we gotta get the trailer to here which is terrifying for a lot of people, but I have a tip that'll make it easier. 
When you turn the wheel to the right and your car starts backing up towards the right, it actually pushes your trailer to the left. And it's natural to panic or overthink or just get confused. It's not really intuitive. So to simplify, drive from the bottom when backing up. And by that I mean, when you pop it into reverse, grab the bottom of the steering wheel. So when your wheel turns to the left, for example, the bottom of the wheel is going in the opposite direction, to the right, just like your trailer will go. Simply push the bottom of the wheel the direction you want your trailer to move, and you can direct it where you want. A question that often gets asked is how far down should you back it up? And that's one that you can't really answer without a whole bunch of questions and follow-ups. How big's the trailer? How steep's the ramp? How big's the boat? What I like to do for comfort is have the top of the beds just out of the water so I can see it. You're going to need a little bit of effort to get the boat on there, but it'll settle in nicely. You really can't do this without getting your feet wet, but sometimes if it's cold or something like that, you want to maybe avoid it, but don't count on it. I got my father-in-law who's going to bring it in, and not unlike docking, there's no rush. You got to be confident with what you're doing, but you can see it's settled into the bed there a little bit. I'll do a segment later on how to secure and haul out by trailer, but I'll be facing a family mutiny if I take this boat out of the water. So I'm gonna re-release Gramps into the wild. This is some classic trailer and release stuff right here, folks. And I don't trailer when well, I do trailer. <laughs> Starting off strong. <laughs> like a glove <laughs> and we'll clean that up in editing and it's gonna look great what in the good gravy is that they've got a rope and they very politely told me not right now is anyone tell them what's in my wallet that's got to be the problem i'm an eccentric millionaire billionaire <laughs> <laughs> 